How do we take a picture of the Milky Way? Are we really going to live on Mars? And why don't black holes have a better name? All this and more in this week's question show. Welcome to the question show your questions, my answers as always, wherever you are across my channel, if a question pops in your brain, just write it down and I will gather it up and I will answer them here. Now we do this show live every Monday at 5pm Pacific time. So if you want a much better chance to have your questions answered to join the chat, follow up questions and then stick around for overtime, where we do like another hour long uh, questions and answers. Uh, please come to the live show Monday 5 p.m. Pacific. There should be like a reminder here on the channel. So check it out. All right, let's get into the questions. Lance piles thoughts on jumbos recently discovered by JWST. So this term jumbo, I forget what it stands for. But essentially, these are binary rogue planets. And James Webb found hundreds of these binary rogue planets in the Orion Nebula. And this was like, Webb was able to find objects that were down to the size of Saturn. And in fact, these objects had been found by the Hubble Space Telescope previously, but they were much larger, they were like brown dwarf sized. And so with James Webb, they were able to determine that these things were all the way down to, like I said, the size of Saturn. And what makes it really exciting was that dozens of them were found in binary pairs, where you had two of these rogue planets of varying sizes orbiting around each other. And that is a huge surprise. Because astronomers were expecting that you would have like rogue planets would be kicked out of an existing star system. And so it was no surprise that you would find them inside the Orion Nebula, you've got all these stars that are interacting very closely. And they're kicking each other with their gravitational nudging. And so planets are getting kicked out. And then they're just wandering in the Orion Nebula. And it's no surprise they found hundreds of them. But what is surprising was that these objects were found in these binary pairs. So either two rogue planets found each other in the Orion Nebula, and then went into some kind of three body interaction, so that they were able to go into orbit around each other, which isn't impossible, but is not very common. But the other possibility is that they formed in place that just like stars, you can get rogue planets that are forming in place out of the gas and dust that's found in the Orion Nebula. And like they may very well have like little little moons around these planets. So imagine you've got like just enough material that a Saturn's worth of planet forms, not a star, not a brown dwarf, a Saturn. And there's a piece of research that we're going to be reporting on in universe today that I don't think anybody else is sort of working on. And that is that astronomers have done follow on observations now with radio telescopes, and they've been able to confirm the existence of some of these jumbos in the radio spectrum. And so it's perfect, you know, you get the one version in infrared, and then you get another version in radio, and that sort of pins down various characteristics of these objects. And if you're seeing that many of these objects in the Orion Nebula, it means these things are floating all over the place in the Milky Way. And what went from Oh, maybe there are a few rogue planets to Oh, maybe there are as many rogue planets as there are stars to Oh, maybe there's as many rogue planets as there are planets to maybe there's more rogue planets than than planets that are orbiting around stars. So it is this really exciting unfolding discovery that is just, I think, over the next couple of years is going to dramatically change our understanding of the composition of the Milky Way. And you're about to ask if it could account for dark matter. And the answer is no, because uh, even though there's a lot of planets, they're not very massive. And so they really don't account for 10 times the mass of all of the other stuff in the galaxy. Now you've probably noticed the Star Trek planet name that's above my shoulder. And this is a chance for you to vote to tell us what you thought was the best question. And the winning vote from last time was from smack dab. Can any extremophiles on Earth survive if we brought them to Mars? And uh, people liked my answer. We liked your question. So as always, uh, just stick around, you're going to see all these planet names show up and then we'll have a list of them down in the show notes down below just when you're writing a comment or just like that's all you do just put in the name of the planet that you thought was the question that you thought was the coolest. And that gives me feedback so that I can know what stuff you're all into. And we will celebrate that next week. 
Lilo the Dog 10, can you possibly explain how we took a photo of our own galaxy? Yeah, you can go out any night when you've got clear skies and you're far away from city lights and you set up a camera. Well, you can see it with your own eyes. You can see the Milky Way as this giant band of stars that grows across the sky. And you can take a picture and you can sort of resolve all kinds of interesting features in the Milky Way. So that's pretty cool. Now, I get that the question you're asking is how have we got a picture of the Milky Way seen from a different angle seen from outside the Milky Way? And the answer is we haven't we can't, we're stuck inside the Milky Way, we're stuck on Earth. And so all the pictures that we can only take have to come from, you know, where we are. So how do we know what the structure of the Milky Way is? And this goes to one of my favorite missions, which is called Gaia. And this is a spacecraft developed by the European Space Agency. And it uses an incredibly sensitive technique to measure the distances and motions of stars that are all around us. And it is measuring well over a billion stars in the Milky Way, which is like 1% of the stars in the Milky Way. And obviously, that's not all of the stars in the Milky Way, but you measure a billion stars, 1% of the stars in our galaxy, and you're going to start to get a really good sense of the shape and the movement of all of the stars in the galaxy. Most importantly, astronomers have been able to measure the distance to various spiral arms that are around us. And so from that, you can tell like, does the Milky Way have one spiral arm, three spiral arms, and it looks like it has two right now. And then the other thing is that astronomers look for star forming regions where like when we look at a galaxy face on, we can see all of the star forming regions in that galaxy. And when we're inside the Milky Way, we're stuck in the plane of the galaxy. And so we can look out and we can see that, oh, this star forming region is in one of the closer spiral arms, like the Orion Nebula is in one of the spiral arms. And it's called the Orion arm. And then you can see and detect other star forming regions that are in spirals that are behind that. And then there's other methods as well that astronomers use, they can use pulsars to detect through radio waves. And in fact, astronomers have been able to map enough pulsars, which are like neutron stars that are blasting out radiation to get a sense of in fact that the Milky Way galaxy actually has a bit of a warp to it. So it's not like a perfect flat disk, it's been kind of warped through interactions with other galaxies. And so it is a very tricky problem to figure out the shape of the galaxy that you were trapped inside. And it just sort of goes to show how precise and how careful astronomers are with the work that they do to be able to have a reasonable answer. Now to actually take that picture of the Milky Way, we're gonna have to wait a few million years for someone to send a spacecraft that could go far enough to actually take that picture. But you know, we can be pretty confident that we know what it's like. Malik mystery. Does the Schwarzschild radius have any effect on why the Big Bang would not have collapsed? Gravity is too weak in super extended space, but not in more localized clusters. So like the question that you're asking is why didn't the Big Bang just turn into a big black hole and collapse in on itself again. And one of the really sort of weird coincidences is that when you take all of the mass and energy in the observable universe, and you pretend like it was a black hole, it would have an event horizon the size of the observable universe. That's pretty weird. Uh, but it's just a coincidence. It's just a fluke that those two numbers are roughly the same. But back in the early universe, absolutely mass and energy were absolutely dense enough that they would turn into a black hole. But it's not about the mass and the density. It's about having density differences. So you can imagine you've got this early universe with all of this mass and energy that is incredibly dense, it would love to turn into a black hole. But the problem is that it can't choose that it is so even that no place can actually be able to pull into a black hole while other parts are going to be pulling it away. And so everything was very balanced early on in the early universe. And so it could never get its act together to turn into a black hole. Like in the case of the kinds of black holes that form today, you need this incredibly dense region that is surrounded by much less dense area. And everything was just too even early on in the universe for it to be able to turn into a black hole. The other thing is really important to understand is that like, what is the observable universe today was is just one tiny little piece of a much larger universe. Like, we see this region that goes out whatever 45 billion years in all directions and 
It was once the size of a grapefruit, but that's not like the whole universe. That's just one little piece. And right outside the observable universe that that we can see, there was more universe and then there was more universe on the other side of that and more universe above it and below it, maybe infinitely in all directions. Save the planet. You're one smart and informed person and you bring it like no other. Why are we wasting time and money on Mars? If we could terraform it, we would preserve Earth first. Next choice for an extra Earth colony. Yeah, I think there is a narrative that went around for a long time. And there was a lot of really sort of cool people who were talking about it, like Carl Sagan and Robert Zubrin, like, like, I read the case for Mars, and it got me so excited about Mars exploration, that I started universe today. Um, so I was a totally, I was a Mars colony booster. I thought it was going to be great. We we're all going to live this science fiction future living on Mars. But over time, I've become wiser. I have learned more about how awful Mars is. And I've just watched the pace of space exploration. And I think the the grim reality of how difficult it will actually be to live on Mars, and how awful it will be like just how little Mars offers up for human beings to live and go about their just ongoing day to day existence are going to come into conflict with each other. And so you're going to have this place that is trying to kill you at all times. And the benefits of living there just aren't great. And we have examples here, like, like you can go and you can build a house on Antarctica if you want. Um, you know, there's no nation can claim it. But if you want, you can go live in Antarctica, build a house made of rocks, and just like live out your life there, you could fish, you can breathe the air. There's times when the temperatures are above freezing. And it will be bad, you won't enjoy it, you'll kind of go, Oh, you know what, I kind of want to go somewhere warm. And you can and you get on a boat, and you get to come home. Mars is not like that. Mars, the gravity could be weakening your bones all the time, and maybe it might make it so it's impossible to gestate children. Um, you can't walk outside without a spacesuit all the time. You could just never get a breath of fresh air. You're always going to be breathing the farts and sweat and garbage smells of everybody around you that any time spent outside under the radiation of space is going to be making you sick and increasing your chances of giving you cancer. There are no trees, you can't walk outside and be in nature, you, you got rocks, you got desert, that's what you got. So I think that that on the one hand, we're realizing just how difficult these, you know, we're having trouble sending humans back to the moon It's taking to longer than we thought the spacecraft space travel is hard. And then on the same time, the destination Mars is gonna be really hard. And I know like for some people like that's the point, like, boy, it'd be great to go to Mars. I can't wait for that challenge. And there's a, there's a great TV show called Alone that they film here on Vancouver Island, where people go and they spend like as long as they can handle it living in a Vancouver Island fall. And you know, I, I've lived every year of my life in a Vancouver Island autumn. And I wouldn't want to live out in the forest without access to electricity and television and all that kind of stuff. Like it's hard, I get it. And they all one by one just go crazy. They get sad and they get homesick. And so we may be enthusiastic to want to go live on Mars today. But I think over time, you know, the people who go to Mars, give them a couple of years and they're going to want to come home. And then the place will be abandoned. So that is the near term, I think. And like our heads have been filled by science fiction, like like what has informed our opinions about living on Mars science fiction, and not like personal experience and the kinds of personal experience that we do have like being in a submarine, like being in a research station in Antarctica, like these are challenges, they are adventure. But they are not like the long term future of human beings, you you get to go home after you've been in your submarine voyage, you get to go home after being at Antarctica for through the winter. And I think that's what's going to happen with the moon and Mars that we're going to have a research station on the moon and astronauts are going to go there and they're going to do research work. We're going to have a research station on Mars and astronauts are going to go there, but they're going to be keenly aware that they're eventually coming home, because there is this enormous planet sized infrastructure that is just keeping them alive. And, and they have very important scientific work to do. And then it's time for them to come home. 
And I think you're exactly right, which is that if we can terraform an entire planet, can we take care of our own planet? Can we take care of Earth? Can we make it even better than what it would just be naturally with even higher biodiversity, cleaner water, less dangerous um, disasters and things like that? I think we can. And so I think that's a really interesting challenge. And I, so I think the more we learn about space, the more we're learning to appreciate our own planet. And I think that will continue on into the future. And like, that's the near term. And I think that for the for the far term, then you have to flip things completely around that human beings have a tendency to develop technology at accelerating rates that places that were considered inhospitable in the past will become hospitable. And it will because our technology has trivialized the problem. And, you know, I use examples of like millions of people who live in places like Phoenix, which is a desert and can't support the kind of population. Well, our technology has trivialized that existence that you've got electricity and air conditioners and highways and airplanes and all of that and logistics and all that kind of stuff that makes living in those places possible. And that there will come a day when we will have powerful forms of propulsion, maybe we've got uh, metallic hydrogen that you can just take off from one planet, fly to another planet, we'll be able to resupply at a rapid pace, we will have compact power systems that are able to supply energy, we'll have a much better understanding of closed loop ecosystems so that people can live and breathe and, and not be sort of stuck in the waste of all of the other people that are stuck in the, you know, the tunnels with them. And then everything changes. And then we're living in our own Neil cylinders. And then we're living on Mars. And then we're visiting Titan. And then we're flying off to other star systems. So I think the key is just to get on that technology curve at the right time to decide, okay, now is the time we've trivialized it. Now Mars is feeling like a viable place for us to live. And I always say like gravity wells are for suckers. Like, like, if you go to space, why drop into another gravity? Well, just live in space. Let's build some really cool rotating space stations with artificial gravity protected from radiation. That'll be really cool. But even that it's going to take a long time before we get there. Blake Stewart, what do you believe is the most likely scenario and timeline for a human presence on the moon at this point? NASA can't seem to get this. I'm not sure why you're disparaging NASA on this. Like NASA has been delivered a budget by Congress. A bunch of lawmakers have defined the law for what NASA is supposed to do, including the development of the Space Launch System, including the development of the Orion capsule, including the suppliers that have been chosen. NASA has no choice but to use Boeing and so on for the development of these rockets. So they don't have a lot of wiggle room in what they can do. So like when you say like NASA can't seem to get this, like NASA doesn't have a lot of choice. The, the laws of the American government are defining what NASA is allowed to do. What do I think is going to be the sort of the likely timeline? I think we are now at the point with our technology, and this is sort of go back to the previous question, where human beings are going to have a presence on the moon, a permanent presence on the moon. We live in a time when human beings live in space all the time. There have been humans continuously in space since what, 2000, when the first astronauts went up to the International Space Station. And then there have been astronauts, space shuttles, Dragon capsules, Chinese space stations. So there have been human beings and we're going to get to that place with the moon. So we are going to have like obviously the first initial Artemis three mission that's going to land humans on the moon May 2026. But come on, it's going to be later than that. Um, or the Chinese will get there by 2029. And then there's going to be some combination of private and governments landing humans on the moon. And the technology is mostly worked out at this point, like it can be done at a fraction of what it cost in the Apollo era. So now it's not just like you, you take an enormous amount of your country's gross domestic product purely to embarrass your enemies that you can get to the moon first. Now you go because that's in your exploration budget and that's where we're going to get to. And so with Artemis 12 and 14, you know, eventually we're going to see some kind of station on the moon with astronauts coming and going. They go to the deep space gateway, they go down to the moon, they put in their time on the moon, they go back to the gateway, they come home. There's going to be two or three astronauts on the moon at all times. And there will be some day and it won't be too long within a decade where the first permanent human researchers arrive at the moon 
And, you know, they, they, they're going to be there for six month shifts or whatever it's going to be. And they come and they go. And there will never be a time from that point forward unless something disastrous happens when you don't get to look up at the moon and say there's people there. And within a couple of decades after that, you'll be able to do the same thing with Mars. You'll look at Mars and you'll say there are people there. It's pretty cool. If you want to support the work we do at Universe Today, consider joining our Patreon club. Your support lets us have a minimum of ads and no sponsorship messages. Patrons get no ads on universetoday.com for life. Want the extra parts of the live stream that aren't in this edited version? You can sign up for a special patron-only podcast feed and get the overtime segments as well as other special behind-the-scenes episodes, including our monthly question show only for patrons. Thanks to everyone who already subscribed and welcome to the recent newcomers. Beastifer. Adam, Bob O, Siggy Kemler, Wayne, J2B, Samuel Dupree, Nemed, Patar Vakutin, Rich Kennedy, Greg Brand, Mr. J. Blanchett, Patrick J. Mahoney. Join the club at patreon.com slash universe today. Kyle Vermast. First question, fellow Canadian. I have an eight-year-old son who is incredibly interested in space. What would be a good place to start with him that isn't obviously too deep, keeping him interested? Thank you. When you say you're son is incredibly interested in space, then I think you need to roll with that, which is that you don't need to make this to over trivialize this. Like, I remember when I was an eight year old and I was into space, I was reading textbooks, I was watching Carl Sagan, I was, you know, watching documentaries, I was also watching lots of science fiction, I was reading books, like, look at how excited kids are about playing Minecraft or things like that. So I don't think you know, obviously, you're going to want to let their interest in this drive it. But for a thing that a kid is really into dinosaurs, whatever, um, they can handle much more advanced material than you sort of think, like, people always ask me, like, when are you gonna make stuff for kids? And I say, I already do everything I do. Kids will enjoy because if they're into it, they're into it. And so I think, um, you know, there are so many amazing resources, obviously, you know, all the stuff that we do, I think, you know, none of it is, you know, you're not gonna hear me swear um, ever, right. And so it's all nothing is going to be like something that you would feel uncomfortable allowing the kid to watch. There's always astronomy cast, which is this long running podcast that I do with Dr. Pamela Gay, where we talk about different topics in space and astronomy. And a lot of people find it's a very accessible thing. But then there's so many great channels here on YouTube. Um, oh, like okay, I could just it just goes on and on and on. And depending on the level that your son is into, you know, Crash Course Astronomy with Dr. Phil Plate is really good. He's sort of like a just soup to nuts discussion of all things space and astronomy. There's ones that are a lot more for on the astronomy side, people like Dr. Becky, um, uh, Astrum. I'm, like I'm, every time I do this, I just feel bad that I've forgotten all these names of, of people who are doing a great job. So I think that it's just a matter of, you know, you finding this stuff with your kid and then just seeing how they react. And if it's too complicated, then dial it back. There's so much stuff from NASA about launches. There's great documentaries. You just got to figure out what are the things that that he's really into and then find more of that. And it's bottomless. Now, the only problem is that doing those kinds of searches on YouTube, there's a lot of kind of AI nonsense channels that have kind of compelling stuff. So my recommendation is find presenters who you really trust, and then just dive into their content and, you know, look through the list of their videos and just ask them what they want to watch and then just go with it. But, but yeah, like I think people make a big mistake underestimating the ability for young people to understand very complex topics. Chris Moore, any updates on the Artemis situation? So the time that I'm recording, we got the official announcement from NASA that they are delaying Artemis 2 and Artemis 3. So originally, Artemis 2 was expected to launch in November 2024, which is like just a few months from now. Um, and then based on what happened with Artemis 1, they had some issues with the battery system, issues with the uh, temperature regulation, as well as sort of how the ventilation was working in. And so for safety concerns, they decided that they want to push back the launch of Artemis 2. And this is the one that's going to send four people around the moon back to 2025. And like, that's not a big surprise. I mean, 
the fact that we've already got Artemis one in the rearview mirror is kind of cool. And so seeing Artemis two go next year. Sure, fine. Now this causes more delays because that's how critical paths work. And so uh, Artemis three, which was going to set humans on the moon in 2025 is now being pushed back to 2026. And you know, it's not just like all of the the sort of delays coming from Artemis two are going to sort of cascade onto Artemis three. But you've got this additional vector, which is the SpaceX Starship. And we're, we still haven't seen a successful launch of the Starship, the full super heavy, we haven't seen the ability for Starship to return to Earth for the super heavy booster to land by and be captured by the Mexilla for the Starship to land and be captured by Mexilla for the two to be stacked back up for them to be able to fly to space to transfer cryogenic propellants in space high teens number of times to fly to the moon to demonstrate a landing like there's a big to do list that needs to be accomplished before Artemis three is ready to fly. And I think with all of these moving pieces, I wouldn't be surprised if we see Artemis three slip as well. Now the sort of interesting race that is happening is that the Chinese are planning to have humans land on the moon by 2029. And they're sort of proceeding through their uh, critical path uh, smoothly, that all of the pieces are coming together. And I totally believe that they're going to set humans on the moon in 2029. And so the question is, will various delays mount up on the Artemis so that the Chinese are the ones who are there first? And I'm sure the Chinese would love that. But uh, hopefully, uh, we're going to see human beings set foot on the surface of the moon in 2026. Because like, if that happens, that all kinds of really good things have happened. That Starship works, that transferring cryogenic propellant in space works, that the human landing system works, and that the flyby of Artemis two with four humans on board that worked and we can get show that it can keep people alive in space for that period of time. And that means everything's ready to go for Artemis three and we see humans on the surface of the moon and a fully reusable two stage rocket system, a super heavy lift vehicle capable of launching the capsule to the moon, as well as a capsule capable of keeping four human beings alive in space for better than a week. So this is all going to be good. Johnny Miles, if the speed of light is the fastest, how can the farthest galaxy be moving away from us faster than the speed of light? So when you measure the speed that galaxies are moving away from us, it all depends on their distance. And so it's not that the galaxies themselves are moving away from us faster than the speed of light. It's that space itself is opening up in between us and that distant galaxy. I mean, that galaxy is probably moving a little bit, but the vast majority of the speed, the apparent speed of that galaxy from our perspective is that the universe itself is becoming less dense over time, that galaxies are being carried away from each other. And there is this sphere around the Earth, which at a certain point, when you look at the galaxies, they are now moving faster than the speed of light. And you know, to say that is kind of tricky because there's like a whole bunch of caveats that you have to go into. But the gist is, is that no, nothing can move faster than the speed of light through space, but space itself can make things appear to be moving faster than the speed of light. Blake McCreary, why aren't black holes name fixed to black spheres? Well, also, they're not black. So like, how about light absorbing spheres? would be good. Uh, dark stars, maybe. I mean, you have this situation all the time where some mystery gets a name before enough of the properties of that mystery have been figured out, and that you actually can then give it the proper name. So the Big Bang, for example, I mean, I guess it was big, but it wasn't a bang. And it's definitely not an explosion. And yet when you think about the Big Bang, you imagine this explosion right? It's not that at all. But that's the name. And in fact, was it Fred Hoyle? I forget it was it was a pejorative, like it was a way to put down the idea. Black holes, right? They're not black, they absorb all of the radiation that falls on them. And so they're effectively invisible. And they're small, you know, just a few kilometers across. And so you know, how do you spot something that is invisible that's just a few kilometers across from thousands of light years away, you don't, it's hard. And they're not holes. 
right? When you imagine a hole, you're imagining, you know, some swirling hole that material is being sucked into like a, I don't know, like some kind of vortex. It's not that at all, that they are spherical, that, you know, when you think about a star, imagine a star, but and with that is so massive, that the escape velocity of that star is just shy of the speed of light. That's how massive it is. And so you need to have only light can escape a black hole, like or only light can escape this star. And that, that's effectively what a neutron star is like a neutron star is so massive that really only radiation can get away from them. And then you add like a little more mass. And now not even light can get away from it. And well, now the thing winks out because you can't see it anymore. But then you've got dark matter. Like, oh, like I spend so much time trying to explain to people that dark matter might not be matter. And it might not be dark. It's just a name that dark matter and so people are like, Oh, like a scientist got to make up things. Well, like, what if it's that we don't understand gravity at the largest scales? And that that would be the explanation for dark matter. Dark energy, same thing. These things get their names because you need something to, to tie it to. So just like don't overthink it. Don't worry about it. You know what black holes are. I know it doesn't help people to try and sort of understand wrap their minds around what it is that they're looking at. Like, where does a black hole go? It doesn't go anywhere. You know, always, you know, we, we make this reference or just joke in astronomy cast, right? Like where where does a when a frog looks into a blender? Where does that blender go? Everything disappears into that blender. I wonder Des 2 E. Will bone density loss be lower on the moon compared to the loss on the International Space Station? Probably, <laughs> we don't know. Um, you know, one of the big problems with being in microgravity, zero gravity in weightlessness, is that you don't have the force of gravity pulling down your bones. And so your body goes, Oh, we don't need bones anymore. Okay, no problem. And so the bone density goes down the the molecules in your bones are used for other things, you get to decrease your overall metabolic rate and your body thinks it's just great. And then you come back to Earth and you have trouble walking around. And so astronauts have to put in hours every day of exercise to keep their bone density up, as well as improve their cardiovascular condition. And through weightlifting, on the space station, which I know sounds really weird, but they have machines that provide resistance, as well as running, which again is really weird, but they're able to do this on a treadmill, they are able to minimize the loss of their bones and their cardiovascular conditioning while they're in space. And so when you think about being on the moon, the force of gravity on the moon is 15% the force of gravity that it is on Earth. And so in theory, your bones again are going to go, Oh, thank you for bringing us to an environment where we don't need to be that strong anymore. And so all the cells in your bones will leach out into your bloodstream and you'll have appropriate bones for being on the surface of the moon. Or if you go to Mars, you have appropriate bones for the surface of Mars, then you try to come back to Earth. And now your body is used to one sixth the gravity on Earth, and you're going to have problems. And so you go to the moon and you're going to be working out all the time. You go to Mars, you want to come home, you're going to be working out all the time. And this is just going to be the reality. Like, like, remember, you want to go live on Mars? No problem. Just don't forget to spend three hours weightlifting and doing cardiovascular exercises just to maintain parity with how you would be back on Earth. And this is one of the things that like, you'll know people are serious about human beings living on other worlds when artificial gravity experiments have been done in space. Like right now, we know what weightlessness does to the human body, but we don't know if it's possible to what lower amounts of gravity you're going to do. And so you're going to need to build some kind of rotating space station, you're going to need to put astronauts into that rotating space station, and then they're going to need to be there for a year in one sixth gravity to find out what it's going to do if they're going to try to live on the moon for a long period of time, or one third gravity, see what it's like to live on Mars. And sure, you could just do that experiment. You could, say, you could say, you know what, it's probably gonna be fine. Let's just go to the moon. And we'll come back in six months, we, we, you know, it can't be as bad as weightlessness. So we'll probably get over it. And that's probably fine. Um, Mars, you know, there's like, are you going to take a family there? Like, with the birth defects? We don't know. So uh, as soon as those experiments are done, we'll have a better idea.
Rasmus Ostergaard Anderson. If the zoo hypothesis is real, wouldn't the aliens have saved the dinosaurs? So like the Fermi paradox, right? Like universe big old, uh, life should be everywhere. Yeah, we don't see it. Where is everybody? And people said, well, maybe it's too big. But you know, like all every explanation for the Fermi paradox falls short. And we're planning on making I think like, like a Fermi paradox iceberg video, where I'm just gonna spend two hours knocking down every what about so that you're as haunted by the Fermi paradox as I am. When you go through this entire process, the only argument that holds any water, in my opinion, and scientists, many scientists opinion is the zoo hypothesis. And that is like Star Trek, the prime directive that we're living in a universe that is actually populated. And there's a million aliens out there and they're living on their worlds, but they won't interact with us until we have achieved some level of conscious I don't know, consciousness or we've reached out or we find them or but maybe they're even like modifying our perspective of the universe. And so we actually can't see the universe as it truly is. We can only see the universe as they want us to see. And so that is the zoo hypothesis. And obviously, when you look when you watch Star Trek as as a sort of example of the zoo hypothesis in action or the Orville, you see right away what the problem is, which is that, you know, Captain Kirk wants to date the planets of uh, women. And so you're constantly having people sort of violate the prime directive and people are finding about it, the existence of aliens. And so, you know, unless every single alien is in perfect lockstep, like maybe they're the Borg and they no one can ever like, just try to break into the zoo for laughs. It just doesn't hold water with me. But uh, if you're asking, would the aliens have saved the dinosaurs? No, I mean, the whole point about the zoo hypothesis is that you don't interfere, that you let that planet just go through whatever it's going to go through until it achieves space flight or until it achieves some level of of enlightenment or who knows what it's going to take. So we haven't met it yet. Now, I, you know, I, I, you know, of all of the responses to the Fermi paradox, the zoo hypothesis is the one that I like the best, but I hate them all pretty equally and much prefer the we're alone in the universe answer to the question. We're first or we're alone, which, um, you know, people think that sounds crazy. George 1562, will we get a Neptune mission in our lifetime? Yeah, I think so. Um, now back on a recent sort of list of proposed NASA missions, they had four that they were looking at a two missions to Venus, a mission to Io and a mission to Neptune. And I would have voted for the mission to Neptune and the mission to Io and not the Venus ones. I've been, I've been convinced by friends that Venus is interesting and maybe shouldn't be pushed into the sun just yet, which is fine. Okay, I get it. But uh, but I really would have loved to have seen that mission to Neptune and especially Triton. Triton had geysers before geysers were cool. So when Voyager 2 flew past Neptune in 1989, one of the things that they saw at Triton were geysers, and they were like dark geysers. And we need to go back and we need to understand what's going on. Are they the same kind of geysers as we've seen at Enceladus and possibly at Europa? What is this about? So there have been a couple of missions that were proposed. And in the most recent decadal survey, which is this giant meeting that that astronomers and scientists get together for once every 10 years, they set the priorities for where they want to go in the solar system. And one of their priorities, if there's enough budget, which means it's not going to happen, is a mission to Neptune. And so we could see a mission to Neptune, you know, get approved by the end of this decade. But there's also like they'd like to see a mission to Enceladus and they'd also like to see a space telescope capable of resolving habitable worlds as well as some other priorities. Uh, so that's like the last on the list and like some of the higher priorities never get it as well. But there have been some other proposals and we've covered this plenty on universe today, which by the way, is the website that I run, um, where there have been some six trimmed down versions of missions to Neptune where you do like a flyby as opposed to an orbiter. 
And so you can do it for a fraction of the price and still do do some really good science. There have been some really great ideas for for missions to Neptune, some really aggressive ones that I like, like, for example, you know, like slowing your spacecraft down is tricky and difficult. But what if you use the atmosphere of Neptune for aero braking? And so you fly as fast as you can towards Neptune, and then you just skim the upper atmosphere of Neptune to slow yourself down. Well, now you don't now you can go there quickly and you don't need a lot of fuel. It's just kind of dangerous because you're flying through the atmosphere of Neptune. So an aero capture at Neptune mission, which we've covered on universe today. Like I only tell you about 10% of the stuff that we're working on at universe today. We've got so many cool stories anyway. Um, and then the other thing is the Chinese. So the Chinese are planning a flagship mission to Neptune. And their plan is the complete opposite, which is that they want to put in a 200 kilowatt nuclear reactor onto the mission and use a ion engine. So it will be very powerful, it will be able to fly to Neptune, it'll have mountains of energy for it to be able to do any kind of exploration that they want to do. And this is one of their proposals for exploring the outer solar system. So a lot of people are thinking about Neptune, it's a wonderful world that we really should go back to and explore some more like not only because of Triton, but there's just interesting features on Neptune itself. And these kinds of worlds, these these ice giants, we're finding much more about them around the universe, like a lot of these things are being found. And to understand exoplanets better, we need to better understand Neptune and Uranus here in the solar system. So yes, please, Neptune mission, and I'll let you know what happens. All right, those are all the questions that we had this week. Thank you, everyone, for asking questions in the YouTube comments as well as everybody who showed up for the live show. This is super fun. Um, now, I'm going to talk about another thing that you can see in the night sky. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to Abe Kingston, Andrew Gross, Antonio Lofi Lara, David Gilton, and Dougie Stewart. Dustin Cable, George, Hey Twyla, Jeremy Mattern, Jordan Young, Josh Schultz, Mark Anstis, Stephen Krasaki, and Vlad Shiplin, who support us at the Master of the Universe level, and all of our other supporters. Your support means the universe to us. So in the last couple of episodes, both this and Space Bites, I've been talking about the things that you can do to take sort of advantage of the night sky, the bucket list of things that you should try to get into your head. I've talked about eclipses, I've talked about auroras, and I've talked about seeing rocket launches. So there's one more that is as amazing as those others. And yet, you can't force this one to happen. And that is a bright comet. And I don't really have any suggestions for you like unless you are going to be able to move the position of some object in the Oort cloud or the Kuiper belt and force it down into the inner solar system. You're just gonna have to wait. But there has been an entire generation of human beings who have grown up without seeing a bright comet. And you've seen occasional pictures and some of you have like gone out with binoculars and you've been able to find a comet that is like too dim for the human eye to see but you can see with a pair of binoculars. And I promise you that is not what these things can look like that you can go outside and there is this streak across the sky that is like the distance of your hand held arm's length, that is bright. And it's just hanging there and you can see the main tail and you can see the secondary ion tail. And it's there for weeks. And it just gets better and brighter. And we have not had one of these now for 25 years. And so a lot of people who are like watching this show, you know, you have never seen a comet in your entire life. And we're always waiting for the possibility, you know, it's been 10 years since there was one that was possibly threatening to come close enough that we would get a really good view that would be naked eye, it didn't happen. And so if we find that comet, when we find that next bright comet, you want to be ready. And so one of the best ways to sort of see this is to have a pair of binoculars. And so the, like my advice this week is have a pair of binoculars that you can practice on seeing some of the dimmer comets that are that are coming by every now and then. And that when a true bright comet shows up, you're going to be ready to be able to take advantage of it to take your family in the car go somewhere dark and be able to just take it in. And mostly I'm just complaining. 
<laughs> the universe owes me a bright comet and it hasn't delivered for 25 years. I'm glad that I saw Hale Bob and I saw Hayakitake. I've seen Haley's Comet. Those are the three. And people like in the 1960s, remember comets were even bigger and brighter. And I feel sad for this latest generation that has never seen one. So that's it. Universe, you owe me a comet. That's this week's rant. All right, we'll see you next week.